um, I will in introduce our speakers today. Uh, we are delighted that uh, Professor Rosie Young has joined us, who's uh, one of our important alumni in Hong Kong. Um, this is our first international event, a uh, truly international event, and obviously everybody knows it's in the afternoon in Hong Kong, and uh, so we're delighted that you've joined us. Um, Rosie qualified as a doctor in 1959, having trained at the University of Hong Kong. She was Professor of Medicine in the University of Hong Kong from 1974 to 1999, and is now Emeritus Professor and Honorary Professor in the Department of Medicine, the University of Hong Kong. She serves as the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong from 1985 to 1997. And she's also the founder of the field of endocrinology in Hong Kong. She's a recipient of many honors and awards, including CBE, a, a gold star from the government of Hong Kong Special Administrative Region in 2002. She became an honorary fellow of Newnham in 1988. She's going to talk with another alum of ours, also based in Hong Kong, Dr. Annette Kwan. So, uh, who studied medicine at Newnham as a Prince Philip scholar and trained at Adam Brooks Hospital, the Royal Free Hospital and the London Chest Hospital. In 1997, she returned to Hong Kong and became a specialist in endocrinology, diabetes and metabolism, working at Queen Mary Hospital and as an, an assistant clinical professor at the University of Hong Kong and as an honorary associate consultant. She has over 60 publications in peer-reviewed journals, including Nature, Circulation, and PLOS One. She's also been in private practice as an endocrinologist since 2011, but continues to teach as an honorary associate professor at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, Rosie and Annette are going to talk about Rosie's amazing career in medicine and how to keep such a career going. So uh, over, over to you too, please. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And on behalf of Professor Yang and myself, may I first take the opportunity to congratulate the college on the 150th anniversary. We would have loved to join you in person at Newnham, um, but we are still very delighted to be able to join the celebration of Festival of Arts and Science and Ideas, albeit remotely. It was actually really fortunate that we were scheduled to see you, uh, to meet up with you today, rather than yesterday. In Hong Kong, we had a big storm yesterday and uh, uh, the signal wouldn't have been very stable uh, yesterday. So it was wonderful to meet up with you all. So I'm Annette and it is my utmost honor to have with me here today, Professor Rosie Young, um, to share with us her wisdom and insights from her extraordinary career spanning over 70 years. It's very special for me as well, because um, I've known Professor Young for many years. Um, she actually since my childhood, um, Professor Young was a friend and colleague of my father. And after I went to the UK to study um, for many and haven't met up with her for many years. And guess where I met back up with her at Newnham. She came to Newnham as an honorary fellow and I was there studying um, medicine. So, um, and then after being back in the Hong Kong, um, she has been one of my mentors as well. For me, she is an inspiration. And to many junior colleagues, she has been a very kind and caring teacher. And her devotion to patient care is reflected by her reputation of being the most punctual doctor to arrive at outpatient clinics and always carrying a smile. So Professor Yang, thank you so much for spending time with us amidst your very busy schedule today. Uh, and yeah. Thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, I, also, I, I wish to repeat my congratulations to Newnham College on her 150th anniversary. And also that the program for the Festival of Art, Science and Ideas is very interesting. And I wish I could be there, I could be in, in, in Newnham myself to join in with some of the activities. Thank you. So Professor Yang, you have been in medical practice for almost 70 years. You obviously love your career to be so dedicated and still coming to Queen Mary Hospital every day. You enrolled into medical school in late 1940s, just shortly after the Second World War. At a time, Hong Kong was still quite a traditional society. I suppose few women would even consider secondary, let alone tertiary education. What inspired you to choose medicine as a career? First of all, my, my parents are very democratic. And uh, in those days, they would uh, pay more, more attention 
to a boy's a son's education rather than a girl's education. But my parents are different. My parents' uh, principle is that every boy, every son or girl would give the same chance of higher education. So like most children, I had my childhood dreams. I wanted to be a scientist to, to, uh, to win a Nobel Prize or to be, become a statesman to change the world. But as it turns out to be, it, my career would be very different because first of all, in 1941, the Second World War broke out. I just finished my primary education and Hong Kong was occupied by the Japanese for three years and eight months. During that period, I had no chance to go to school, and, but I was taught by my father Chinese, English and mathematics. So that when the war ended in 1945, you may remember from the, hist from the history lessons, I could join a secondary school again. And in 1947, two years later, I became matriculated at the University of Hong Kong. I could choose any faculty I liked in those days, but I thought that because I had no good foundation in the knowledge of science and my language ability, especially English was so-so, you know, just, just pa 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 passing. So I thought that if I took up science or uh, uh, humanities, I would not be able to get a, uh, uh, a good pass, uh, high honors when I graduate from the University of Hong Kong. So at the same time, my uh, my two elder brothers, my two elder brothers, study medicine at the University of Hong Kong, and I realized how gratifying a doctor's career could be because I often saw uh, the patients uh, very happy and very grateful when they recovered from a serious illness. So they were very grateful to the doctors. So I thought that doctor, medicine being science and art would be a very good career for me. So I joined, uh, I, I joined the MBBS or medical course in the University of Hong Kong in 1947. So during the many years as a mm. physician, were there memorable moments which you felt had reaffirmed you that being a doctor was really as gratifying as you had imagined? Well, there were many. But I probably should just mention two. First of all, in, in the 19, in 1950s, 1960s, anterior poliomyelitis was very prevalent in the world and it affects young people and it can be fatal because it can cause respiratory failure. The only way to save a, usually a child, a child's life is to put him into a respirator. And in those days, the respirator was an iron lung. It's like an iron coffin. In Queen Mary Hospital, where I worked, there were only two iron, iron lungs. And one day, a young man was admitted with ascending paralysis. That is, he became paralyzed from the legs upwards to the abdomen and to the trunk and up to the, uh, to the, to the respiratory muscles and the upper limbs. In other words, he, would, he was going to die from respiratory failure. But the diagnosis at that time well, the, of this young man's illness was not poliomyelitis, was another serious neurological illness. And the textbook says that this neurological illness is fatal. In other words, there's no cure for it. And if you put him into the, into the iron lung, he will be there until he dies. So being a junior doctor, uh, I didn't give it a second thought. I immediately put this young man into, a, into the respirator. And the next day, my professor questioned the wisdom of my decision because according to the medical textbook, this young man would have no chance of recovery. He would have to be in the iron lung until the day he died from it. On the other hand, if at the same time, a second uh, 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 boy, there was only already one boy in the, in the respirator, and a second boy was with poliomyelitis were admitted, and this second boy required a respirator, he would not be able to get into a respirator because there was no respirator left. And this young, young, this young boy, new patient, would have died from the illness. So I was very terribly worried. But fortunately, in two weeks' time, this young man who, 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 whose, whose uh, illness was supposed to be fatal actually gradually recovered and he actually walk, walked out of the hospital. And in the meantime, during those two weeks, there were no new admissions of children with poliomyelitis in the Greenberg Hospital. So this incident taught me a very important lesson. That is, we must try to do our best for our patients, yet we cannot play God. 
and uh, uh, and secondly, not the tech. Uh, nobody is infallible. Tech professors can be wrong. Textbooks can be wrong. Absolutely. And the second second example was you may remember uh, that uh, and that that in nineteen in two years ago, uh, two o two o, I celebrated my ninetieth birthday. And uh, the best birthday present I obtained, I received a lot of birthday presents, but the best present I, I obtained was a letter from one of my patients in the United States. Now, this patient, Mr. X, was a primary school student in the 1960s when he was admitted into Queen Mary Hospital with tuberculosis of the kidneys. Again, tuberculosis was very common in those days. He stayed in the hospital for several months and he received daily injections and he had multiple uh, investigations. During those few months that he was in hospital, I used to visit him after office hour in the evening when I finished my work and to, to talk to him and to teach him uh, teach him mathematics to help him do his homework in mathematics. Later, he graduated from high school and he went and went to United States and he became a professor of medicine. In 2020, he wrote to me when he retired from the chair of uh, uh, mathematics, not medicine. When he re retired from the chair of mathematics in the United States, he said how grateful he was uh, to, to me for the encouragement and the help I gave him during his long illness. So this tells us that when we treat patients, we must do it to give them holistic care, holistic care. In other words, we look after their physical condition as well as their mental illness. Sometimes we have to go out of our way to help our patients if necessary. Mm -hmm. That's why medicine is called an art and a science to enable this holistic care. So Professor Yang, in the 1950s, when you first joined medical school, um, the medical field was still rather man-dominated, unlike now, where over half of our graduates were all women. Um, during your studies or in, while you're working as a junior doctor, had you ever encountered discrimination or felt disadvantaged being a woman doctor? Strangely, uh, the, the <clears throat> medical professionals, uh, they are very, very educated, and I did not get any discrimination or unfair treatment from my colleagues. Uh, in fact, my colleagues, like your father, were, it, were very polite and uh, gender and considerate. Sometimes it's embarrassing. For example, when we walked to, when we walked together in a corridor, they, they would stand aside to let me pass. That, that is rather embarrassing. On the other hand, uh, and actually, there's no discrimination against women in promotion in the university in academia. However, some patients who were less educated would would expect all. Uh, all doctors to be men, and any woman would be either could be either a nurse or a maid. For example, one of them asked me sub, uh, to uh, hand him hand him a hat a back pen, uh, thinking that I, I was one of the maids. <laughs> yeah. so Professor Yang, you were one of the mentors who inspired me to become an endocrinologist, and you founded the field of endocrinology in Hong Kong. But in your days. And the endocrine system was still very much an enigma. How did you actually decide to specialize in endocrinology and how has the field changed over the years? Well, the field has uh, advanced a lot in these years. Uh, in fact, I graduated from the University of Hong Kong in 1953 and in 1959, I obtained my doc doctorate of medicine. In 1958, I had my first sabbatical in uh, not, not in the, the, the Cambridge yet in Glasgow. I was working, I worked in the Glasgow Royal Infirmary and I took another specialty, hematology, that is blood diseases, as a specialty in my endocrine, in my membership examination. But at the same time, I attended the endocrine clinic of the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Now in those days, endocrinology or, med, med, or diabetes was a, was, on, was a medical, as a medical specialty, was just embryonic. For example, diagnosis was based entirely on the patient's clinical picture, i.e. signs and symptoms. Investigations were practically nil. And, uh, uh, but but uh, while I was in, in Glasgow, autoimmune disease, you may remember Hashimoto thyroiditis was discovered. And later, uh, that, that we could measure 
different hormones in the blood and also at the same time imaging like CT scan and MRI scan now become household names develop rapidly and more importantly our engineering enable uh, uh, enables us to manufacture purify hormones not, not those hormones without any side effects and uh, to be administered to patients who need them so endocrine endocrinology was really mm -hmm. advancing by hip leaps and bounds since yes. then and it becomes a very uh, interesting topic for both healthcare and uh, research. So that was your first sabbatical uh, in the UK. Did you then uh, have another sabbatical later on? Yes, the most, the, 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 the most memorable one is my sabbatical uh, in Cambridge from 1963 to 1964. <laughs> and it came to me as a really a happy coincidence. In 1962, the University of Hong Kong was the only university in Hong Kong, and the Hong Kong government was contemplating uh, 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 to establish a second university. So they invited an expert team to come to Hong Kong uh, to, 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 to give us advice. The, and the chairman of that team was Professor Frank Young, the professor of biochemistry at Cambridge University. So one day, my mentor, Professor A.J.S. McFadden, called me into his office, introduced me to Professor Frank Young, and asked Professor Young to take me in as a research fellow the following year. So in 1963, I went to Cambridge, and I became an associate fellow of Newnham College. Uh, the, 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 this, the, this was really an eye-opening eye -opener for me because in Cambridge, and in Newnham College, I had the chance to meet all kinds of people, uh, the, the, uh, undergraduates, postgraduates, masters, principals, and, uh, and, so, and so on, and Nobel laureates and so on. I could attend all kinds of lectures outside my own field. That is very interesting because you know, as when you study something, when you learn something, you go, go to lectures and you don't have to take examinations, it's very entertaining and you can <laughs> absorb more. So I learned all kinds of things, and uh, this and this really had a tremendous impact on my career and in my on my outlook in life. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, in addition to Newnham College, the other college that I often went to was Conwell and Peace, and uh, there I met uh, uh, Professor Joseph Needham. As you know, just, just Joseph Needham is well known for his work on the uh, history of of science, engineering, and medicine in, in China. He could, he could speak perfect, perfect pen, Putonghua, much better than, than my Putonghua. And uh, I met all kinds of people there, and they were, they were very, very uh, uh, inspiring. Mm -hmm. Wow, so your relationship with Newnham College and the University of Cambridge actually dated back to almost 60 years ago. But I understand that your relationship has did not just stop there. It seemed to have continued through all these years. Is that so? No, it has never stopped. Uh, although I left it more than I have I left Cambridge more than six decades ago. Because first of all, I, I am a member of the executive committee of the Prince Philip Scholarship, chairman being Sir, Sir, Sir um, David Lee, and this scholarship offers, uh, uh, the Prince Philip Scholarship offers uh, undergraduate scholarships to, uh, to uh, young people from Hong Kong, you, are, you were one of them, to, to study in Cambridge. And I, at one time, I was on the selection committee of the Jardine Scholarship, again for undergraduate scholarship, and I, I had been on the, new, on the Joseph Needham uh, postgraduate uh, scholarship also. Mm -hmm. So this keeps up my 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 link with with Cambridge all the time, but the the, the thing that I, I I really enjoy most are the informal gatherings that Joy San Lam Yong Lam Kong organized every year for our for our alumni uh, for our new alumni to meet once or twice a year. In fact, more than twice uh, twice a year sometimes uh, to meet together, and at these gatherings we could reminisce on our life at Cambridge, and also we could share uh, our, the, our the news the, or the, of our recent events, and it was a very happy occasion. Unfortunately, because of the COVID-19, we have not been able to do that uh, for two years. And if, 
And in fact, last year, 2021, uh, we were all looking forward to another gathering because uh, our, our past uh, principal, uh, Dame Carol Black, was to come to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to receive a honorary degree of science, Doctor of Science from the University of Hong Kong. But as it turned out to be, she couldn't come because of the COVID. I really hope that the COVID or is mutants or will, will go away and yes. travels can resume uh, between Hong Kong and Cambridge. Yes, indeed, we all hope so. The professor, you have devoted much of your career to education, being professor of medicine since 1974, the first woman dean of medicine at the Faculty of Medicine from 1983, and then subsequently pro vice chancellor at the University of Hong Kong from 1985 to 1997, and you're still serving as a council member of the university. What changes have you seen in education over all these years? Well, I just have to correct, uh, correct one mistake. I, I came up off the Council of the University of Hong Kong last year. Oh, right. Okay. So, Sorry about that. Uh, well, <laughs> when we talk about education, the edu everybody's, the, the trouble with education is that everyone claims that he is an expert, but in fact, no one knows, knows the answer of, of uh, what's the best education uh, for Hong Kong, for example, uh, in Hong Kong, as you know, we have a, a new uh, uh, chief executive last year, and I hope you can do something about education in Hong Kong because we do need improvement. But no one knows the answer, and I don't know the answer either. It is education, I think, is a basic right of everyone. I'm glad that in Hong Kong, no one is prevented from receiving education, including higher education, just because he kind of afford it, because there are plenty of scholarships, bursaries, loans, uh, public, uh, public from public ones as well as private ones. So as long as you can pass the public ed education, you're qualified for it. You can get into the into the university. But I think it's uh, financial support is not the only thing that we want. I think we want like, we want diversity because there are still young people who, for one reason or other, cannot who, uh, realize their full potential through education. I think education should be more di diversified, and there are people who require a second chance, and there are people whose talents lie beyond academic uh, subjects, and. Uh, uh, therefore, I'm I'm all I'm and very enthusiastic support of open education, distant education, etc., to give people a second chance. Mm -hmm. So, apart from working at the hospital and for the university, you had also served in many committees and councils in honorary and advisory capacities. It really baffles me to understand how you can find so much time as well as generate all the stamina to serve. Are there any words of wisdom that you wish to pass to young students now? How should they feel themselves as members of society? First of all, I'm, I've been able to serve with, you know, at different uh, public committees and uh, the, largely through the understanding and, and help given to me by my colleagues in the university and hospital, including your dear father. For example, they can take over my clinical duties at a moment's notice if I have to go to an unscheduled meeting, uh, meeting. As members of this community, I think we have, we, we have a duty to contribute to its welfare as much as we can. In fact, we have benefited so much from the, from, from the community, especially in Hong Kong, for example. Uh, the free education, I told you, uh, mm -hmm. from, from primary, from pre-clinical, preschool to, uh, to, to primary, secondary, and tertiary, free education. We have obtained so much from the community. And therefore, we must try to give back some of it to the, to the community. I'm referring to not only contribute donations and so on, many people do that. I'm referring to voluntary service. I think in, in doing voluntary service, we must consider what we can do not we can not uh, we, what we can give, not we not we cannot we can get. In other words, whether we get any reputation or we get an honor from it, this is out of the question. We should always do what we feel is the right thing, and we must try our best. Yes, absolutely. We should all remember that. Well, 
Last but not least, I was actually going to challenge the audience to guess how old you are, but you gave your secret away. <laughs> well, but I'm sure actually none of the patients that you, whom you saw yet uh, last week at the diabetes clinic could guess um, to would believe me if I had told them your age, because you know you are 92 years old and you're still practicing as a doctor as well as actively serving in so many councils is absolutely amazing, Professor Yang. I'm sure everyone here can't wait to hear your secret um, of to good health and longevity. Maybe we can't quite share, you know, change our longevity genes, but we would all love to learn how to live our lives meaningfully. Well, I think I must correct you. I'm not yet 92. I'll be 92 in, in October, <laughs> just uh, still a few months 92. away. So now I say I'm 91, not 92. Well, first of all, I always say that you can, in, in this life, you can have a choice of everything except your, your parents. You cannot choose your parents. You cannot change your genes. So longevity lies very much in the genes. So how long is the telomere? Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, if you have good genes, you must live a good life. Good life meaning that you, first of all, you have to, 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 you have to avoid drink, uh, smoking and drinking in moderation and do a lot of exercise, which I don't, and uh, to avoid being overweight. I can see that you, you, are, you have never been overweight, neither, neither are your parents, uh, exercise and so on. And, but this is the physical, physical part of it. And of course, air pollution nowadays, we, we talk about climate change and air pollution. Uh, again, air pollution is out of our, our direct control, is the country's direct control. But, and also, you, you have to live, live in a peaceful, peace, peaceful society. Um, having gone through uh, the Second World War, I realized how terrible war is. Uh, and be, uh, living in a peaceful society community is a way to long life. But, the, but apart from the physical aspect is the mental aspect. And the mental aspect, aspect is that you have to be positive. You have to be tolerant. You always look at the bright side, bright side of things. And you must try to, to live every day to the full. And, uh, and, and therefore, I'm so grateful that I can still do a part-time part -time job, can still do voluntary work, because you allow me to stay at home, for example, in the last two days, two days was a typhoon. I stayed at home all the time. I became so bored. Uh, but, and lastly, you must be grateful for all the blessings that we receive every day. Yes, indeed. And we are very grateful to you too for all these advice and um, things that we definitely will try to live our lives to the very full. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rosie and Annette. And we do feel blessed for your words this morning. Um, are there any questions, uh, both uh, either in the room here or uh, in Hong Kong? Um, and uh, a particular hello to Joy Shan, who's helped get people in Hong Kong to, to join the, the Zoom this morning. Any questions? No, nothing. Can I, can I just ask you one, Rosie, and then, and then we'll wrap up, which is, what, what is your view on complementary medicine? Do you, are you somebody that um, goes on, on, uses both, or are you very much non yes. Now, com complementary medicine. Some people think that Western medicine and complementary, compli Western, uh, med med uh, med Western trained doctors practicing Western medicine, they are against complementary, med complementary medicine. Well, I, I, I don't agree with them, but there's a lot to, 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 to do if we want to, uh, to, um, to, to encourage a complementary medicine. Because first of all, complementary medicine doesn't, doesn't talk about, uh, 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 it doesn't have surgery, for example, it doesn't have radiotherapy, it's only traditional medicine. And the, main purpose of complementary medicine, as I, as I can see, is to build up one's immunity. And that is important, for example, in COVID-19. Before we had the antiviral agent, you can build up the immunity, so you can overcome, you can cure, you can cure the disease yourself. So there's a, lot, there's a lot to good about complementary medicine. The only trouble with complementary medicine is that it doesn't have the 
uh, scientific basis for it. It doesn't have the so so say uh, uh, random control trial RC, RCT, which you know one name control trial. You have one drug and another placebo, and you can compare the two. And if we can can investigate the effects of complementary medicine, especially Chinese medicine, in the scientific way. I think uh, uh, there would be a lot of uh, good thing uh, uh, advantage come out of it. For example, they talk about acupuncture. Now there is scientific basis for acupuncture because many, many years ago, uh, when I was a medical student, there was a neuroscientist who uh, published papers on acupuncture because you look at acupuncture uh, on, a, on a body and you do a lumbar puncture to get several spinal fluid, you can actually get the so-called endorphins in the CSF if you do it properly. So there is a scientific basis for acupuncture. And there is a scientific basis for complementary medicine. For example, a lot of the very potent drug comes from traditional Chinese medicine. Quinine is one of them and, uh, and so on and so forth. So if I always, sorry for say it's all for, for being biased, I always blame the Americans because the Americans have the have the have the manpower, have the money, and have the philosophy, have the freedom to study complementary, to study Chinese, I'm talking about Chinese medicine and Chinese medicine. Now in China, it's very difficult because in China, we, the, they adore traditional Chinese medicine. You criticize traditional Chinese medicine, you may, you know you'll be heavily criticized. In America, you don't. So America, I always look to, look to America to, uh, to, 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 to investigate the usefulness of Chinese medicine. Perhaps Cambridge can take that up. <laughs> yes, Cambridge has got so many Nobel laureates. That's, that's very interesting. I used, to, I used to work at University of Westminster and we did a lot of work with traditional Chinese medicine and uh, went to Taiwan and looked at, and China and looked at um, uni university hospitals, which were split, you know, very, very clear physical splits between traditional Chinese medicine treatments and Western medicine. So that, that the, um, the cross between the two has always been really interesting to me. So uh, mm. it's very interesting to hear Rosie talk about that, that there are elements of traditional medicine because some people just poo poo the whole thing about um, traditional Chinese medicine. And, and clearly there is, there is something very, very seriously, deeply important about Chinese traditional medicine, um, which Rosie has just talked about. So thank you very much for that. Um, is, is there an, no more? In, in fact, I must defend the, 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 the Chinese government because in China, they have very strict rules for clinical trials for traditional Chinese mm -hmm. medicine. They have very strict rules. But the, but the only thing is the, the people believe that in Chinese medicine, they don't, don't care about the scientific basis. Indeed. It's a, it's a whole area that we, we could talk about for, for a very long time. But if I could draw the, the session to a close, just, just by saying thank you so much to our speakers this morning, particularly to Rosie and to Annette, and to the, our people who've joined us in Hong Kong. Um, have a very good evening. We're, we are going to, hopefully the principal and I will be coming to Hong Kong if all the quarantine rules drop, which they don't look like they are going to at the moment, hopefully we'll come in November because we're, we have a, an academic, Professor Claire Hughes, who's, who's doing some work in Hong Kong at the moment, funded by a Hong Kong uh, education um, charity called WEMP. And she's looking at children's readiness for school for naught to four-year-olds. Um, and so she, we're doing lots of work in Hong Kong at the moment. So it'd be very interesting to, to get Rosie and Annette's take on, on what we're doing and, and how we might be able to involve our own alumni in that. So thank you very much. Yes, we look thank forward you. to having you yes. in Hong Kong. Yes. <laughs> look forward to your coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much. Have, yes. Everybody here have a good day and everybody in Hong Kong have a good evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.